welcome to Local Matters. I'm Elizabeth Shanahan Jewett, and I hope this week has been good to you. For the month of July, we're taking a look back at some of our most popular stories. On This Is Who We Are, we featured Kendra Dangora, a local artist and educator who has combined her greatest passions into her vocation, teaching younger generations the power of creative expression. Here is her story. Kendra Dangora is a fine artist, potter, and art teacher. We visited with Kendra in her native Plymouth, Mass, to learn about why art and teaching art is her life's work. I stopped in to chat with Kendra and some people who work with her every day. So Kendra, where do you get inspiration for your lesson plans? Um, I gain a lot of inspiration through Pinterest, um, through books, through the children and what they're interested in. Children inspire you. Yes. If they have a desire to learn how to draw animals or people, we go through a unit of that. What kind of art do you like to do um, when you're home? Does anything that you learn in this class um, inspire you to do art at home? I like to draw animals. My favorite animal is a fox. I a like, fox? I like how they have, the colors they have. I like to get them away from the commercial images of holidays yeah. so we did a unit on masks this halloween and we talked about where masks originate from and how they're used in different cultures and then they were inspired to make their own masks based on their own interests so so these masks are all done by the students that are present in class yes um this pile here is fourth grade i have it i have it in um in order. In order. <laughs> in order. So the fourth grade masks are here. At the what end would here. you say is different about teaching a kindergartner as opposed to a fourth grader? 
Hmm. <laughs> you all know the answer to that one. As they get older, they get more tense about what they're drawing. And oh, in kindergarten, they have no inhibitions whatsoever. More self-critical. Yes, they become more self-critical. Middle school is even harder because mm -hmm. they just don't feel like they do it perfectly enough. Mm -hmm. Whereas there is certain freedom with preschool through second grade where they just do it. So what do you do as a teacher to let those inhibitions go? I make them scribble. Right, guys? Yeah. yeah. You make a scribble. Scribble all the time to loosen up their hands. As you see on the chalkboard over there, we scribble until we get the proportions right. Scribble, cones and circles, right? Yeah. Yeah. We are delighted to have her as a teacher at St. Margaret Regional School. The impact that she has on the students is just amazing. She brings the talent and the gifts out of each student when she gives them an activity to do. So I heard that you worked on a mural in Ms. Dangora's class. Can you tell me about that? So the mural is the, she painted this um, background sky thing on the closet doors out in the hallway and we were doing this rainbow thing when she like paints our hands and um, with some colors and she pushes it up against the wall to make it look like a rainbow with our hands. Hi Bria. Hi. Hi. So I'm interested, how would you describe Miss Dangora's class to another kid? Um, I feel like kids in the future who are in like preschool and stuff, I feel like I would say to them, if you're in Miss Dangora's class, it would be very fun, and um, I'd say you'd probably want to be an artist like her. It's important to have art in the curriculum in the school because it gives the opportunity for the students to share their creativity and to display their talents in various ways in the arts and it also gives the school an opportunity to display their artwork and it is an invaluable asset to the school. Why do you think it's important for art to be taught in the schools? I think art is really important to teach in schools because first of all drawing is a very important skill to learn. No matter what job you have, you're going to learn how to, you, you need to learn how to draw of some kind, right guys? Yeah. yeah we talk yeah. about that all the time. It's also teaching them problem solving. So if you have a specific project and they need to work something out, I encourage them to do that. I'll help them, but I encourage them to do that on their own first. And I think just the appreciation of art itself, the beauty around us. Sometimes we get so locked into the devices and they know how I feel about the devices. Yeah. But I feel that imagination and awareness and observation is a really important thing to have in your life because if you miss out on all the wonderful things that are happening around you, then one day you're just gonna be old and wonder where all that went. How about anything else you wanna say that is important for you? That I feel very lucky that I am a teacher of all these children. It's the best thing ever. And I'm thankful for that. Social Security serves as the primary income for an estimated 42 million retired workers in the United States. But do you know how it got its start? On this episode of In the Know, 
we look back at the origins of this indispensable program. Social Security serves as the primary income for an estimated 42 million retired workers in the United States. But do you know how it got its start? The stock market crash of 1929 triggered the Great Depression, the worst economic downturn in the history of the industrialized world. All populations were dramatically affected, particularly the elderly. By 1935, 50% of seniors in America suffered extreme poverty. Newly elected President Franklin D. Roosevelt was looking for a solution and was inspired by Europe's welfare system. He proposed a program in which workers secured their own future economic security by contributing a portion of their income through payroll tax deductions. This means that each working generation funds current retirees' monthly income and are in turn likewise funded in their senior years. This concept was expanded to also include unemployed and disadvantaged Americans, and the Social Security Act was signed into law in 1935. The first person to receive monthly Social Security benefits was one Ida Mae Fuller of Ludlow, Vermont, a legal secretary who retired in 1939 and collected her first check in 1940 at the age of 65. This very first check was for $22.54. $414 in today's prices. Fun fact, Ida lived to be 100 years old. Fast forward to modern times. If you were born after 1929, you need to work at least 10 years to become eligible for Social Security. A person making $40,000 a year will pay 6.2% of their wages, or $2,500 yearly, in Social Security taxes. That number is matched by your employer. The size of your Social Security check upon retirement will be based on your income from your working years, the year you were born, and your age when you start to take benefits. Most people start at the age of 62. For more information on how much you'll receive and for other important information, visit the Social Security Administration's website at ssa.gov. Social Security. Now you're in the know. Next up, we have craft foodery, in which Max brings us his take on preparing chicken cutlets. What's going on, guys? Today we're going to be making homemade chicken tenders, which is a better option than going to some fast food restaurant. On top of that, we're going to be making a sriracha dip, so stick around and let's get started. Step 1. Cut and season the chicken. Step 2. Prepare the bread bath. Now I'd like to stop the video right here and direct your attention to my amazing pepper grinding skills. Aren't they the best you've ever seen? Probably way better than your pepper grinding skills will ever be. Anyways, resume the video. Step 3. Bread the chicken. Now it's important that your hands don't look like this when you're going through the breading process. Instead, what you want to do is use wet hand dry hand. What this means is to use one hand for flour and breadcrumbs, and the other hand for the egg bath. Step 4. Cook the chicken. Step 5. Prepare the sriracha dip.
Step six is to eat. What else would you do? Now, I like my tenders extra crisp, so I cook them longer. But if you want them to be golden, pull them earlier. The cooking times vary from three and a half to five minutes. And that's how you make homemade chicken tenders. And this can be a healthier option than eating out all the time. Not that there's anything wrong with eating out, but when you have the opportunity to cook at home, give it a shot for yourself. Thanks, Max. And in this episode of Apps Untapped, Tiff and Erica review Pocket Guard, an app that can help you keep your spending under control and your budget on track. Hi there, Tiff here again to bring you another episode of Apps Untapped. Now, lately I've realized my spending habits have gotten a little bit out of control. I really thought that I was gonna save money during the pandemic. You know, not going out, no going to eat, no getting my nails done. But me, being me, has found other ways to deplete my bank account. We should order pizza. I got this. And that's what happened. Gosh, Mark, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Here, have some money. Hey, who ordered all these shoes? They're mine! So today we're gonna talk about budgeting apps. Specifically, a little app called Pocket Guard. All right, disclaimer time. I'm clearly not a financial advisor. I'm just a girl standing in front of her bank account asking herself why she spent so much on Amazon last month. You may have never heard of it, but Pocket Guard is an app that syncs with your bank account and categorizes your transactions based on the merchants you purchase goods from, or the institutions that you're paying bills to. I looked at a lot of finance apps and many cost money. And since we like free around these parts, I chose this app because you can get the most features without having to switch to an upgraded account. When you first set up the app, you will connect it to your various financial accounts, checkings, savings, credit cards, etc. That gives the app a sense of what you're worth financially because you know what you're worth. Specifically, it determines how much debt you have and your spending habits. To set up, you'll put in your email address, pick a password, and choose a four-digit passcode. Just FYI, the app will prompt you to put in your code every time you leave the app, even just to send a quick text. After you're in, you'll need to connect to your bank account. But by the way, that, it takes a little bit of time. At this point, you can go through your account and mark which transactions are bills, so you can keep track of what's coming up for the month. You can choose the frequency at which these bills are taken out, and you can also add how often your paychecks are deposited into your account. Pocket Guard has a bunch of really helpful functions, so I'm gonna take some time to throw a few at you. On the main screen, also known as Overview, you will see the In My Pocket function. This is basically the heart of Pocket Guard. It will calculate how much money you have after savings, bills, putting money away, etc. In other words, it tells you how much money you have to play with for non-essentials. It will also tell you how much money you have per day for the rest of the month. As I said before, you can mark which of your transactions are bills, but wait, there's more. You can also categorize other transactions so you can keep track of what your money is going to every month. As the month progresses, all of these categories are filtered into this super nifty pie chart, which is located under insights. Do you feel like you're paying too much on your bills? Cause you probably are. Pocket Guard actually has a section where they'll help you lower your bills. What kind of bills you ask? Mostly things like phone or other utilities. Just a heads up, it usually does take a few days. Let me set the scene for you. It's the week in between paychecks. You have a quarter of a tank of gas. You're running low on tasty options in your refrigerator. You are basically broke. No judgment, we've all been there. But that's not a situation you have to be in if you budget your money wisely. This app can help you with that. 
It will break down what's coming in and what's going out, but there are a few other budgeting options, such as tracking your income and setting a savings goal. Now that you have some handy functions under your belt, I'm gonna provide you with a few tips and tricks I found out while researching the app. If you're a fan of the hashtag and want a more specific way to categorize what's coming out of your bank account, you can actually hashtag a group of transactions. So say I wanna know how much I spend on streaming services. I could connect my Netflix, Hulu, and Prime transactions to a hashtag to lump them all together. All you have to do is go to transactions, tap on the transaction you wanna use, tap note, add your hashtag, and hit save. It's hashtag pretty cool. Right now, it's obvious that budgets are tight for everyone, and saving a few dollars a month here or there seems like a drop in the bucket. But just remember, if I can save money little by little, it adds up at the end of the year. For example, I managed to get a $9 a month decrease on my phone bill. What I did was take that $9 that I would have spent on my phone and put it in my savings account. At the end of the year, that adds up to $108. That's like three and a half tanks of gas or like a hundred chicken nuggets. It's a lot of nuggets. And lastly, if you need a little bit more help and you didn't see it on this incredibly helpful video, there is a great fact section that can help you out, including a newbie's guide that's pretty awesome. I will try not to be insulted that you went to someone else for help. So there you have it. You learned some things. Way to go, friend. Listen. Finances are hard, new habits are hard, and pandemics, well, they're even harder. We're all doing the best we can, so don't kick yourself too much if you make some mistakes along the way. Just hop back on and keep going, because saving money makes sense. That was a money pun. Get it? No? Okay, I'm, I'm just gonna go. This has been Apps Untapped. It's been great chatting with you. Until next time, be well. The local scene interviewed Boston artist Franklin Marvel when he was here in Plymouth for Art Week about his perspective, his art, and the genesis of the movement he started, which says that more love is okay. Franklin Marvel is a local artist, graphic designer, and social activist. A native of Santo Tomé, Venezuela, his exuberant art is informed and inspired by both his homeland and his community here in Massachusetts. Franklin has started a movement with a message and spoke to the local scene about how the tragedy of the Boston bombing motivated him to use his art to create a message of hope. The More Love is Okay movement. It sounds like something. <laughs> so, I mean, like, everything started a few years ago um, after the the Boston bombing, bombing. And a year after of that tragedy, I went with my whole family and they closed the finish line so you can walk. And when I was walking through the street, I was like, you, I was, we were feeling that, I would say sad, sadness and we will we've, we revive, revive everything. I mean, during that moment, and I was like, wow, it feels, it feels really bad. And while we were working, we were like, okay, I mean, I mean, we knew that this is not a good thing, and we were thinking on the positive side. So, what can we do to make it better? What can we do to, to, to avoid this to happen again? Right? And I was like. This is not okay, and crime is not okay, violence is not okay, and I was like, more love is okay, more hearts are okay, and everything started from there. And in that moment, I went to to my studio at night, and I was like, you know what, I wanna I wanna do something for the city, I wanna, and then I I took one of my paintings, I paint hearts, and. I was, you know what? I want to make something. I want to, I want to put it on some, somewhere. And on a, and then I went to Newberry Street. There is at the end of the Newberry Street. There is a, a wall that everybody, I mean, post like posters, events, poster, and a lot of things. And I was, you know what? I'm gonna put a, a heart that it was framed on a gold frame, and to make it like, to preserve it. I mean, when you when you love something and you care for, 
for somebody or for something, you, you preserve it, you take care of it. And, and I went and I created the, I put one of my gold frames. I took a photograph of the gold frame and then a painting, I put it together and I make, I create a sticker and I put it on one of the doors there and, and I stayed there for two years without saying anything. I mean, it was there, it was my signature, but it was there. And, and the city, every, every few months, they go and clean the whole wall, and, but the heart was there. They repaint everything around, but the heart was there. I was like, wow. That's... So that's the, the, the way you see that, that it gives you a feedback right away, that more hearts, more love, more kindness, more, more positive things are, are good. And there is a heart, it's not just a heart, it's a heart, it goes around twice to make sure that in, everybody is incorporated. It's that simple, it represents community. That's why you see those, t the, those two circles around. But it basically goes like this. It goes around one, two, and then close. And by doing that, we are incorporating everybody. We are, it's a heart that is inclusive. Right now I'm working with the, one of the middle school in Waymo, and we are creating a painting and it's being painted by a total of, I would say, 150 students. So every student has stopped at the painting for a little, for maybe five or seven minutes, and they paint something. And so far we are in the 50% of the process. Tomorrow we're gonna finish it. So, and, and, the f and then you see that it's not just our students, it's everybody painting all the students, doesn't matter if you like painting or not, you are doing something, you are, you are giving something, and you are being part of this. And the school is gonna preserve the painting. And I mean, it, it gives you a lot, a, a lot. So even for the students, they, I mean, they're gonna feel that they belong there. Franklin's commitment to using art to build community and raise social consciousness travels across continents, from collaborative projects in Massachusetts to his native Venezuela, a country which has endured great suffering. What was first is the question. Me being an artist or being socially conscious? That's, I will say that I was an artist and that I was exposed to a lot of situations and cities and people. I mean, San Tomé, Valle de la Pascua, eh, Caracas, Puerto La Cruz. And then we moved to, I, we moved to the United States and we, we went to Miami for seven years. And then we came here to Massachusetts. And sad, but because we are away from Venezuela and everything related with going out of your place, and, but like I say, I always, I have to look for the positive. And um, being still connected with Venezuela, and the bad situation in Venezuela is bad, bad, bad because of the government. And I have, I mean, I always, I'm an activist. I have to speak. If you want me to tell you exactly what is happening in Venezuela, I'm gonna say it. At first, I was afraid to say, to mention something, but we have to speak up. We have to speak up. And that's why I have this heart that is a Venezuela libre, freedom for Venezuela. And like I say, by thinking positively, Venezuela is in a bad situation, but I, was, I went to Venezuela a year and a half, something like that, two years ago, and I saw it. And I was like, okay, what are the things that I can do to make this better? I know this bad, I know it's bad. So I need to do something. And then I create, I, talk, I was talking with my sister and I was like, my sister worked with kids in Venezuela. I was like, let's bring our classes to kids in Venezuela. Kids that doesn't have any, any type of resources. And, and, and I have one of the posters that I use. I went to Venezuela and I created a workshop for them for three days. It was amazing. So as soon as we finished the workshop, we were like, okay, how can we make this to to continue, and and it was hard to get the money to do that, and but we did it. We broke classes for six, almost six, seven months, 
are classes for 50 kids. Unbelievable. They were going to bed on Friday night, dreaming about Saturday morning and Saturday afternoon for the classes. They were like amazing. So I'm working on it to bring it this year too. At the root of Franklin's artistic expression is always the heart, his own, the one he puts on canvas, or the heartfelt spirit animating his subject. When I see an instrument that is a heart, I see a heart in there. And the, and the heart is the people playing the instrument and the people that made the instrument. The heart has four, it's gonna be hard to pronounce this, ventricles, ventricles. And, and I have a sketch of a heart with, where I play with the four parts. I use the fingers because the cuatro, it means that we have four strings. We as an artist, we try things. And because I've, I've been experimenting the music in my head now, I was like motivated to try something, trying to paint life while somebody's playing. There is something around that, that is beautiful and only you can find that when you perform live. And, and I like it. If there is anybody out there that wants to, be, to paint live, just reach out. And um, if there is a stage, we'll do it. <laughs> Franklin says the goal of more love is okay is for people to read a simple positive message with the hope of creating a more loving future. To contact Franklin or learn more about where to see his work, visit franklinmarvel.com. Franklin Marvel is very active in the Boston art scene. Check him out. And next, what is it like to be a cranberry grower in southeastern Massachusetts? We visited family-owned Freetown Farms and met with fourth-generation cranberry farmer Don Gates Allen to find out. We're on the Freetown Farm, located in Freetown, Massachusetts, and we have 27 acres of cranberry bog. Why am I a cranberry girl? Probably because I love it. I, it's, it's, most of us will say it's in our blood, literally. I was born into the industry. I'm fourth generation. This is who I am. This is what I do. A cranberry grower, farmer, you know, we live by the weather, we live by the water. Um, Mother Nature is really what drives our everyday. At this flagpole behind me is where the irrigation pump used to be. And as a little girl, five years old or so, my grandfather Gates would tell me, quick, look up on the hill, which is actually where I'm sitting, uh, you, you're gonna see a leprechaun and there's a pot of gold up there. And so for years, I used to continually look for this leprechaun. Um, sadly, my grandfather died when I was seven years old and I never found that leprechaun, nor did I really understand how could there be a leprechaun up here, but where is this pot of gold? And when I turned 38 years old, my husband and I, with my twin daughters, were fortunate enough to be able to build our house here. So I think what I was actually fortunate enough is that the leprechaun and the, the pot of gold was actually my house. When you come to the cranberry bogs with your family, your grandparents, you start building this knowledge base of the industry, um, of the horticulture and how to grow cranberries and just the connection to, to Mother Nature and, and the earth um, and, and things that we know as cranberry growers, probably like what Native Americans would know about the earth and the, the soils and the trees and the birds and those kinds of migratory connections. We, we know those things as cranberry growers that a lot of other folks probably wouldn't know. And those are the connections that we have to the earth. And, and that's really special. So the cranberry plant is a perennial. And so we as a cranberry grower have to take care of that plant 365 days a year. So it's critical every single day of the year that we take care of our cranberry plant. So wet harvest, you would do a pre-flow of the bog just at the at the vine level 
and then you would come out with your harvesting equipment and then you would knock the berries off. The berries float. The berry floats because it's hollow inside. Once the bog is picked and then the grower corrals the berries and then that's when they would be loaded on to the truck and shipped off to market. You have to have nerves of steels to be dependent on a crop, you know, to be a farmer, because Mother Nature can take it out in one storm. And I think cranberry growers are a breed of their own that just figure out how to do it. Um, and we have been figuring out how to do it for generations. And there's a lot of tenacity that go into doing this, a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of probably tears, a lot of cussing, a lot of swearing, a lot of um, kicking the dirt, throwing the shovel, those kinds of tantrums that people don't see, but they happen. Um, and you see a lot of gray hair for sure. So we're eternal optimists is probably the best way to think about a cranberry grower. Farming cranberries is definitely an everyday job. I guess I just I just love doing it. It's 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 an addiction. We love to grow the fruit. It's it's there's always next year is our thought. Um, if the crop doesn't produce quite the way we think it's going to be, um, we always say there's next year. Uh, we we live for next year. Um, it's the it's the perpetualness of being a farmer. I will never quit being a cranberry grower ever. Thank you for staying with us for this episode of Local Matters. From all of us at PAC TV, have a happy and safe week. We will see you next time. Thank you for watching. We are grateful for your attention. If you like what you saw, please like and subscribe to The Local Scene here and share everywhere. Thank you, friends.